Hello everyone, welcome back to the Grim Dawn build, improv build guide to the Solo Oathkeeper. Now, in the previous episode, when I discussed the largely two ways of approaching building Solo Oathkeeper, there are really two, only two ways to build the skills for Solo Oathkeeper, Poison Vitality, or Fire Physical. Both use a shield, because there are enough shield skills in the solo Oathkeeper where not using a shield is just shooting yourself in the foot. So there's really only two ways of building the Oathkeeper improv as a solo Oathkeeper. That obviously changes if you have a second mastery, but we're talking solo. I mentioned in that video that the constellations get significantly wilder. Welcome to the wilder side of solo Oathkeeper. Now I'm going to be starting right off the top with physical fire. And because of the way that the Oathkeeper's skills work, we want to emphasize that physical. Why? Well, mostly because of the skills at the top, right? Safeguard, physical damage, no fire damage. Smite, does more physical damage than fire damage. Shattering Smash, reduces physical resistance and doesn't do fire damage at all. Eye of Reckoning, more physical damage than fire damage. Even when you bring in Soul Fire, you're still looking at a pretty decent increase in physical damage. Virus Might, only does physical damage until you get the Volcanic Shride, at which point it finally gets fire damage. Physical damage is inherently the predominant damage type of the Fire Physical Oathkeeper. Fire is your secondary damage type, and quite honestly, again, I've mentioned this before, I'll mention it again, of the three elements, fire is the most commonly resisted. Furthermore, getting to Witchblade to get the Eldritch Fire is quite a stretch, and we also don't have Chaos Damage in any of the Oathkeeper skills inherently. In fact, the only source of Chaos Damage you'll have is from Eldritch Fire itself, so we're not going to go for this. You're going to see just how far we have to stretch our points in a bit, but this isn't going to ever be worth it, okay? So we grab our Crossroads, we grab our Assassin's Blade right off the top, and what do you want to assign the Assassin's Mark II. Well, this is going to depend, because this changes over the course of the game. This changes as you progress through the Oathkeeper skills. Off the top, you're going to want to assign it to Aegis of Men here, because Aegis of Men here, once you hit the Avenging Shield, you're going to be seeing this hit four people. So you're going to potentially be applying that Assassin's Mark to four, potentially up to four people, depending on what your crit rate is. Then maybe you'll want to put it on Judgment, because Judgment is just a ten, uh, up to 10 meter AoE, 5 to 10 meters, depending on your rank here. 5 to 10 meter AoE, which means you can potentially hit multiple targets. And then when you get Guardians of Empyrean, you're going to want to put it on them, because they have a cleave attack, even though they don't attack as often, you know, their attack speed is a bit low. They can hit up the five targets with that, and of course, they also additionally have the Celestial Presence anyways, which is reducing resistances further. So, considering you can have two Guardians of Empyrean kicking around, eventually you'll want the Assassin's Mark on the Guardians of Empyrean, which is where I'm going to be putting this for the, you know, for this example, because at the end, this is what you want Assassin's Mark to be on, but of course, again, when you first get Assassin's Mark, because you need to rush this, what that's going to be assigned to is going to be changing over the course of your game. Alright? Now, it's at this point that we have to have a really honest talk about constellations. My favorite constellation for Oathkeeper, regardless of whether I'm doing Physical Fire or Vitality Poison, my favorite constellation is the Obelisk of Men here. It doesn't matter what damage type you're doing, because Solo Oathkeeper has so much shield skills and always wants to be using a shield, for any Solo Oathkeeper build, Obelisk of Men here is always going to be useful. Even if you totally switch from Physical Fire to Poison Vitality right smack in the middle of your playthrough, Obelisk of Men here remains as effective. Okay? Period. End of story. As a result, I always recommend for solo Oathkeeper players, build for Obelisk of Men here. I've grabbed Assassin's Mark because I'm starting with the physical fire, but obviously, if you're playing 
specifically on, you know, if you're going for the Poison Vitality, you would get the Tortoise first, right? But if you're playing Physical Fire, you're going to get the Assassin's Mark first. By the way, for the Tortoise, for the Turtle Shell, always put it on Resilience. Turtle Shell automatically activates at under half health. Resilience automatically activates at under two-thirds health. It's a 16% health difference. Nine times out of ten, if not higher than that. When Resilience triggers, Turtle Shell is going to trigger as well, especially at higher difficulties when you're taking more damage. Turtle Shell goes on Resilience every time because they are, again, 90 plus percent of the time, they're going to activate simultaneously, okay? Anyways, I'm deviating. Obelisk of Men here. Do it. Now, we have the Assassin's Blade, and we have the Tortoise for the physical fire build, alright? How we approach this from here doesn't really change a whole lot. There are certain things that'll change if you're going Poison Vitality. We'll talk about them later. But right now, what we want to do is we want to get to the Shield Maiden. We grab Lizard. We grab Shield Maiden. I always do that. I'm not sure why. Right, and now we have 7 yellow, 15 blue. Drop the crossroads, and you can either get the bull, or you get the solemn watcher. And this is where it deviates slightly. If you're going for, specifically, the physical fire, which is what I'm going to run first, you want the bull. Otherwise, you want the solemn watcher. You want the bull because... You want that physical damage, obviously. Now, what you assign this to is really going to depend. All right. I typically do either Aegis of Men here or Judgment, which one depends on whether or not I'm playing solo or with friends. For Judgment, if I'm, I put Judgment on if I'm playing solo. Okay, because I am the primary target for enemies. I am typically going to be surrounded and... Boom, this is going to hit more people almost every time over a of men here, obviously, right? If I'm playing with friends or family, I'm actually doing Aegis of men here because I'm less likely to be surrounded as completely. And Aegis of men here, since it bounces incredibly long distances, can sometimes help out allies by, you know, hitting them as well. But more importantly... That's just a thing of Vegas of men here that has nothing to do with Bull Rush. More importantly, whereas Judgment isn't necessarily always going to have four people around you when you use it with multiple people, Aegis of men here is always going to consistently hit four people. Okay? Unless there's less than four enemies, in which case Judgment isn't going to hit more than four enemies either, right? So, in this particular example, I'm going to bind it to Judgment because I am assuming solo gameplay here. But if you're playing with friends or family, Aegis of Men here is a really strong contender for this. Okay? Now, you'll notice we have our 8 yellow or white, depending on how you perceive that color. We need a little bit more blue. We go down to Harvestman's Scythe because this is going to give us purple and blue and we'll need that purple in a bit. Alright, so we go on ahead and grab Harvestman Scythe, we get all these really nice stat bonuses, we get increased healing effects, increased health and energy, some good stat increases, it's just a lovely time. Absolutely fantastic. This is where things get a little bit more interesting, right? Obviously we grab our obelisk, let me grab this really quick. Oh, brief moment here, stone form. Be aware that stone form is a 15% chance on block. Blocking itself is a percentage chance of occurring for every attack. You're not blocking everything that's coming at you. You have a percentage chance of doing so. As a result, do not ever put stone form on ascension. Ascension lasts 10 seconds. You only have 10 seconds to activate stone form, which is a double probability skill. In other words, there has to be two probability checks made before that can activate, rather than the usual one, right? This makes it almost impossible to activate this off of Ascension. Either A, you put it on Presence of Virtue, or B, you put it on your ultimate skill. Whether this is Path of the Three or Divine Mandate doesn't really make a difference. Put it on your ultimate skill. 
at some point you will always want it on your ultimate skill. The presence of virtue is whether or not you have your ultimate skill yet. If you don't, you put stone form on presence of virtue temporarily until you can get your ultimate skill, at which point then you throw stone form onto that. Okay. In this particular example, I'm going to assume you already have it. We're going to put on Divine Mandate here for this example. And then we're going to talk about purple. Now, you have two interesting choices here for this. Okay? You can go for Oleron. And if you're going for a heavier damage build for regular builds, right, regular gameplay... That absolutely works out. We make an adjustment on hardcore, but we'll talk about that in a second. This is, by the way, on block. You put this on presence of virtue. If your stone form is temporarily on presence of virtue, don't sweat it. Stone form is more important. Leave stone form on presence of virtue until you get your ultimate skill. Then make the switch. Then put Targo's hammer on presence of virtue. It's fine. Grab the Owl for the old standby, because again, we're getting increased burn and internal trauma duration, which is lovely, which we love to see. We have increased total damage, we have increased uh, elemental resistance and decreased energy costs, we have a nice boost of stats there, and then we can get a lot of Ulleran, right? Now, at this point, you have to make a choice. I recommend, at the very least, you go for the head. All right, you're getting increased internal trauma damage, you're getting increased offensive ability, which increases your crit chance, which everyone wants. You're getting increased max pierce resistance, which has never hurt anyone in the history of Grim Dawn. Which one of the remaining two you want, though, is going to depend. My personal preference for Solo Oathkeeper is the hand, not Blind Fury. Why? Well, two reasons. You're going to be, as a solo Oathkeeper, you're going to be using a single hand weapon because you're going to have your shield, obviously. The 75% weapon damage doesn't go quite as far with single hand melee weapons as it does with two hand melee weapons, obviously. So this isn't going to hit quite as hard for you anyways because you are using that single hand weapon. Secondarily, this only activates on critical attacks, right? Obviously, again. This 12 to 16 physical damage Every single regular attack you bust out, all your abilities, plus the 120% increase in physical damage, this is going to go a little bit farther for you with a single hand melee weapon than Blind Fury will, in terms of consistent damage output, okay? I'm not talking about long term. Long term depends on how lucky you are, what your crit chance is, etc. If you have a high enough crit chance, absolutely Blind Fury will in the long run do more for you. Absolutely. But how good your crit chance is depends on your equipment, because that is dependent upon your offensive ability, which depends upon your the things you've attached to your equipment. It depends on your equipment itself. That's a whole thing. But this is consistent. You always know it's happening. You don't have to basically gamble your life on it. I just like this better, for terms of pure consistency. Okay? Could I calculate at what critical percent chance that Blind Fury would in the long run more likely be better for you in the long run? Absolutely! But this also assumes consistent probability, which of course is a whole philosophical, statistical subject that's not worth getting into. And <laughs> not in a Grim Dawn video. <laughs> If you feel unlucky, don't do this anyways. It doesn't matter what the numbers say. If you're just an unlucky person, you're just screwed either way, right? So for terms of consistent damage output, just go with the hand, all right? Just do the hand. Shake the hand. But I mentioned that this isn't necessarily always what I do. Why? Well, if I'm playing hardcore, I don't want damage. I want durability, right? So we drop the owl, we drop Ulrin. And what we go for is Targo. Everyone's friend, Targo. Everyone loves Targo. Targo's great. Now, the shield wall, that's 20% chance on attack. Aegis of Men here, or Vyra's Might. Judgment if you really want to. Uh, that really depends. Which one of these is going to be very much down to, you know, your kind of personal preference? I usually use Judgment, because if I'm building... 
and I'll switch this to uh, Aegis of Men here for example reasons, but hold on, let me actually finish through this thought. Now, if I'm building Targo, I'm building Targo because I'm in Hardcore and I want the durability, right? So we're talking about increased armor, shield block, you, all the good stuff. I want shield wall to happen as often as possible, so I will sacrifice increasing, you know, increased bull rushes for increased shield walls. This is increased shield damage blocked, this is increased armor, this is stuff that I want if I'm in hardcore, right? I don't, again, if I'm in hardcore, I'm not looking to kill things fast, I'm looking to survive the apocalypse, all right? And if you're solo hardcore, judgment's the way to go. If you're not solo hardcore, if you're playing this with friends, if you're playing hardcore with friends for some unholy reason, then yeah, I would say maybe go Aegis of Men here, but broadly speaking, not a whole lot of people play hardcore with other people. They usually run hardcore solo. Use judgment for this. Get that shield wall as often as possible. It'll save your life, okay? Multiple times. And go ahead and take the reduced bull rushes because, again, in hardcore, damage is less important than durability. And then you can just slap in these two points here in Korvac and either do more damage or, again, since this is hardcore, either grab increased Aether resistance or increased Chaos resistance according to your needs at the time. I'll just throw it here just for kicks. But yeah, basically, if you're going for a non-hardcore run, get Olorin. Right? Great. If you're going hardcore, get Targo. Do the Targo. But, what about Poison Vitality? Well, Poison Vitality has a really interesting constellation problem. While I'm pulling out points, let's talk about the, in the interesting constellation problem with Poison Vitality. Unlike the physical resistance which is conveniently on the readily accessible Assassin's Mark. Oops. The poison and acid resistance reduction and the vitality resistance reduction are locked behind some very interesting constellations. Now, first off, again, we still want Obelisk of Men here even with the poison vitality. Obviously, we won't be getting Assassin's Blade because we're not doing physical damage. Again, pretty obvious. What do we get instead of Assassin's Blade? We get Lotus, because we need the green. Lotus also gives us some great stats. We get increased health and energy. We have increased healing effects and physical resistance. Right, We have all these great stats. Okay, so we have that. We drop this. Oops. Great. We want to get to Murmur, because she gives us our... Poison and Acid Resistance Reduction, and it's a pretty substantial amount. That's 30%. That's a lot of Poison Resistance Reduction. We grab the Red Crossroads, we grab the Rat. Alright, boom. And now we have everything we need here. We have the green, we have the red, okay? We grab Murmur. Boom. Guardian of Imperium, because again, we're trying to spread that resistance reduction out to as many enemies as possible. The Guardians are great for this. I typically like to grab this as well for the Vitality Resistance. I don't necessarily grab this. Alright, there's more cold damage increases here than the Acid Damage. I generally don't find this worth it, so we just leave that be. You could go for Affliction. I typically like to go for Affliction, right? This is just an easy grab here. We grab this Crossroads here. And uh, lo and behold, we get Affliction, which is Poison, Vitality, right? Just absolutely lovely time. And then this goes on to, again, you'll notice we have Presence of Virtue back up because we do not have uh, Targo's Hammer, right? We slap the Fetid Pool on Presence of Virtue here. Uh, I actually forgot really quick. Hold on. If only... Hello? There we go. Not sure what that problem was. Path of the three here. And now we have one point left over, right? Now, you might be wondering, well, Vitality Resistance, what happened to that? It's locked behind Ratosh, the Veil Warden, who does absurd amounts of Aether damage as well, which we don't do at all, okay? We don't even do Aether damage, all right? It's just, no. It's locked behind, you know, Ratosh, who is by himself pretty difficult to get to. Yes, we have the yellow. Yes, it's not too much of a stretch to necessarily get the green or the red, but you can see we're already at one point. We would have to do a pretty heavy restructuring. It's honestly not really worth it. 
You also might be wondering, Professor, why don't you go for something that does, say, more poison vitality damage? Well, the Abomination here also does chaos damage, which, again, we don't do. The only reason why we even go for Murmur is because she's really easy to get to, as I just proved, and she reduces the poison resistance by a really significant amount. Just like with the physical fire damage, um, Oathkeeper, where we ignored the fire resistance because it was too far out of our way to get to, it's the same thing with the vitality resistance, right? And also, again, when you look at the way the poison damage works here, or the poison and um, vitality damage, this is... You know, Aegis of Thorns is doing the primarily acid damage. When you increase Path of the Three, you will notice that you have everything converted to acid damage, not converted to vitality. Vitality is there, do not misunderstand me, but it is very clearly the secondary damage type. The primary here is the poison and acid, right? Same thing here. Acid, we do get the vitality, okay? We do get that, but it's mostly acid okay so we don't really actually need the vitality damage the vitality damage is just to help us overcome enemies with really high poison resistance which aren't that many enemies in the first place but because acid is our primary damage type here we want rumor okay we really want rumor we don't need anything else and again the abomination that is quite a stretch. I mean, 18 green is really difficult to get our hands on, and as I've already mentioned, because of the way that con the constellations increase the poison and vitality damages, a lot of the times you're quite unintentionally mixing in damage types that you don't even do. We don't do cold damage, right? We don't even do that. We only have that there because we need rumor because our primary damage type is poison and acid. And this is the real problem here is that, and this is also why I really prefer to go for the Obelisk of Men here, is because, to be really honest, that's going to be more consistently useful than some of these other things. I mean, the purest form is Affliction here, because it's actually poison and vitality damage. So you actually can use this whole constellation really effectively. You can even see it right here. Vitality damage, vitality decay, acid retaliation, poison damage. This is lovely. All right, but this is the only damage constellation that does only acid, poison, and and vitality damage. The rest of them splash one of the two with something else. The abomination is chaos damage. Splash. Even if you go down the poison arm and get that poison vitality damage, right, which you can see a little bit here, you're still going chaos damage. Here's some acid and vitality. Here's some poison, right, but you're still getting a little bit of chaos here. And again, this is a huge point investment. Can you do it? Sure. Is it worth it? No, not in my opinion. You have to go out of your way for something a little less efficient than Stinking Obelisk of Men here. Which, again, regardless of what damage type you're going to do, is going to be equally as effective for either the Physical Fire or the Poison Vitality. So if you want to change at the drop of a hat, which you may want to, I'll get into that in a second, but if you want to change your damage type in the middle of a playthrough, you can do that with Obelisk of Men here very easily. You swap Assassin's Blade for Lotus or vice versa. You swap the bull for the Solemn Watcher, unless you went for the Solemn Watcher anyways and never went for the bull, because you wanted that option open and you wanted to make it, you know, more convenient. And you just went with the Solemn Watcher right off the top. I mean, the, at minimum, you would still need to swap the Assassin's Blade for Lotus. And if you, you know, are in Ulrun or whatever, you'd have to pull out Ulrun, the Owl, Anvil, Hammer, and then go into Murmur and Affliction and the Rat, of course, but, you know, it's very easy. Obelisk of Men here, you know, absolutely fantastic regardless of what you're doing. And it's significantly more efficient because you're not mixing in things. I mean, the only real mixture here is, at least on the way to Obelisk of Men here, is this small amount of internal trauma damage. And even then, you're not even getting it for that. You're getting it for the shield block. You're getting it for the, the shield recovery time, for the reduced stun duration. You know, you're not getting it for that. And it's not like it's not like the shield maiden is fifty percent internal trauma damage. It's only one node that actually does that. This one right here, right? So it's not really that big of a deal. You could also, by the way, incidentally go for the scarab as well if you really wanted to, because that actually has some acid retaliation, right here. Uh, totally optional. Doesn't really make a big difference, right? This is a, a fun aside. You could actually do that instead of the shield maiden. I prefer the shield maiden because it gets you a lot more. 
all right? All the shield bonuses, but you can absolutely go for the Scarab. In fact, let's really quickly go for the Scarab. Really quick here, right? Just so you can see this, because it's not really that big of a difference. So we grab the Scarab, we pull out from the Shield Maiden, we put our points back into Affliction. The only real reason you would want to do this is so you can grab some points into the Scorpion, really. Not that big of a deal. Like I said, it's it's not a huge change. Right? But, and I mean, there's not really anything that is blue and green either, right? As you can see here, just so you can see as an example here, there's very little overlap there. You could theoretically go for the Manticore, but again, that's very difficult to do. We also don't have pets. It's just... I mean, Acid Spray is nice, but again, it's it's a bit more of a stretch. You have to get another, you know, red segment, which is a little bit more difficult to get your hands on. You could go for the bat, but that's bleed vitality. You don't really do bleed, obviously. It's just... It's, it's just... There's a lot of things that are so close to being perfect for this, but aren't quite there. It's my only real issue with the Poison Vitality Oathkeeper build, and again, this is why I go for a Robles of Men here a lot of the times, but yeah, whether you go for the Beetle or the, uh, the Shield Maiden, not a huge difference. But, that's how I approach the constellations here of Solo Oathkeeper improving again, so you can switch between, and the reason, just as a brief couple minute diatribe, I do improv because I began playing ARPGs with, obviously, Diablo, Diablo 3, and, of course, there's not a huge build variety in Diablo, there's a handful of builds in Diablo, Diablo 3, that are actually, you know, consistently useful, but I wasn't as into Diablo 3 as I am in Grim Dawn, so... I probably am not aware of a lot of a lot of the you know behind the scenes stuff on that one. But where I really started to get into improv was Titan's Quest, which was uh Iron Crate's previous game. They were I think THQ Nordic at the time. And um that was sort of like the the prototype to Grim Dawn. There was fewer items, there was less build variety there, right? The skills were a little bit less honed, I would say, but, you know, with that, it was really a matter of, you know, I'm going with this mastery, so I pretty much only do these two types of damage, and then Grim Dawn was released, and I started playing Grim Dawn, and it's like, wow, there's a lot more going on here, and there's so many different combinations and approaches that, you know, I don't have to be locked into one build for the duration of a playthrough like I was in Titan's Quest or Diablo 3. I can I can change things as I'm going through and that has gotten the ability to shift your build in the middle of a playthrough has only improved as they've released DLC and updated the game. And that's why I improv, right? I don't like to be locked into one thing. I actually just a couple of days ago I saw a Reddit post by somebody who was unhappy with their level 44 Reaper or something. And it's like, I've been there, right? I, I know how that is. But if you're locked into a specific build, it's harder to walk away from that, right? That is a much more difficult thing. Um, so I improv, right? That is that that concern with, oh man, I'm sick of this character. I really wish I'd picked something else. By running improv, even if you get tired of whatever you're doing with the character at the time, if you do it right, you are absolutely going to be able to shift that in the middle of your playthrough and have restored your faith in, you know, the mastery combination. Because it doesn't matter what mastery combination you are. At the end of the day, if you approach the building correctly, you can improv your way through the whole game and keep things fresh for you regardless. And that's gotten even easier with this update because you don't have to go through Elite anymore, which makes things a little bit faster, a little bit more hectic if you skip right to Legendary. That's a whole conversation I'll have one day, uh, probably during my playthrough. Um, 
but yeah, that's why I like improv, and that's why I recommend improv. Also, Monster and Frequence are, in my opinion, the most powerful pieces of equipment in the game. Um, love those. I love the thrill of, of trying to, you know, of, of seeing a, a Monster and Frequent and looking at it and being like, can I, we, can I make this work? <laughs> can this happen? It's just, that's, that's just what I love about the game. Uh, a lot of the times I go semi-improv, I'll usually pick a Monster and Frequent to kind of run with. I'm actually doing a semi-improv with family right now where I'm running a Barog's Bloody Arm semi-improv where the only constant is Barog's Bloody Arm, of course. I'm running Shaman Nightblade, and the only constant is Savagery. The rest of it's been fluctuating pretty frequently. I'm currently running uh, the Briarthorn, but I might not in the long run, you know what I mean? Um, I love it, but that's why I improv, and... Improving really is easy with solo Oathkeeper because again you can run Obelisk of Men here and boom, you know you it doesn't matter which damage type you go for Obelisk of Men here is going to be there and it's going to be as effective and you just have to change a constellation or two to shift over. I mean a constellation or two towards Obelisk of Men here. Your damage constellations obviously require more reworking, but it's absolutely fantastic. But if you're improving solo Oathkeeper. This is how I approach my constellations. All right, this gets significantly more complicated as you tack on a second mastery because that changes the scope of your options drastically. Again, oathkeepers, solo oathkeepers, don't have a hell of a lot of options, but that changes significantly with the addition of masteries, more so than a lot of other first choice masteries. But we'll talk about that in time. With that being said, though. Thank you all very much for listening and watching. If you liked this, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, please ignore me. And if you have any comments, questions, concerns, ideas, suggestions, or requests, please leave them down in the comment section below. And thank you all very much for joining me, and have a great 24 hours.